are almost there. We are so close. Do you realize the journey we've been on in this book? We have taken almost half a year. We've got 22 plus lessons if you add it all together. And, and um, you ought to know Philippians pretty good right now. In fact, you ought to basically be able to qualify as a Philippian citizen. And so, uh, you know, you, can, you, could, you could like move there, get your second home there. You would, you would know half the people if, if they haven't died in the last 2,000 years. And um, uh, it would be a delightful place for you to be. Now, if you take my road trip theme a little bit further, any of you from Texas will certainly recognize where you stop when you're on the road. <clears throat> Bucky's. So if you're from somewhere other than Texas and you don't know Bucky's, you can move here and you can find out, though Bucky's is now expanding, I think they're in Georgia and a few other places. But we're going to use Bucky's as our theme and we're going to do three things this morning as we bring this book to a close. Hopefully we're going to find a deeper fellowship. I want to challenge you and I want to challenge myself. I think God wants us challenged as a class to find a deeper fellowship with each other. So that's going to be the first thing we'll talk about. Then the second thing we're going to talk about is what I call an uncomfortable truth. It's true. It's something that's very true, but it's something that's not comfortable to talk about. And we don't, we don't I, I don't talk about it much because it's not comfortable to talk about. But we're going to talk about it because it's in there. So, and it's true. And then the third thing we're going to do is just take a moment and, and observe that there is a larger world than exists where Bucky's is. And so uh, we'll do that. So those are our three chores this morning. We're going to start with finding a deeper fellowship. Now, the passage that we're up to, ah, there they are. These are our friends from South Africa. Gentlemen, y'all come up here for just a moment, please. <clears throat> come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I want you to introduce yourselves. Come on, give us some of that South African accent. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Vuyani Sindo. Vuyani with a V. Yes. Okay. Vuyani Sindo. And what do you do in South Africa? I'm a lecturer at George Whitfield College in Cape Town. A lecturer for the college in Cape Town. Yeah. And it's George Whitfield College. A Bible College. Bible College. Good Christian school. Training yeah. up ministers to serve in Africa. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Nathan, introduce yourself, please. Hi there. <laughs> you have to say hi back, right? Hi there. <laughs> I thought that's how it works. Uh, my name is Nathan. Uh, I'm, I'm Viani's colleague at George Whitfield College in South Africa. It's, it's really great to be here with you. Great to be visiting you. Great to meet the and, church and, like and It's amazing. You teach Hebrew. I teach Hebrew and Old Testament. Hebrew is the language the Old Testament's written in. I'm, I'm sure you knew that, though. <laughs> yeah, they're good. They're good here. This, this class is good. And you've got, I'm detecting a bit of an accent. Yeah. Uh, I'm not actually South African. I have lived there 10 years, though. So South Africa is my home in, in the way I think about it. But I'm, a, I'm an Australian. Uh, I'm <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Good day. <laughs> okay, thanks, guys. So join me in giving them a welcome. Would you be sure and take a moment to greet them after class? Uh, uh, they lectured at the library last night on wisdom and leadership, and it was really, really wonderful. If you missed it, I hope you'll get it posted uh, 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 once we get a chance to watch it once we post it on the internet. All right, so we are in Philippians 4. We're going to bring the book to a close. We're, this is the verse where we start today. It's Philippians 4, verse 14. And it says, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. Now that's where we're starting because we left off in verse 13 last week. The problem is this word plain, which is translated yet, plain in, in Greek, translated yet, it necessarily is tying something to what's already been said. So we can start with verse 14, but when you start with verse 14 and you've got this word yet, you got to go back. So let's take a moment and look in the rearview mirror and remember the passage that we just had because this is going to be relevant to us. Paul has just said, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You, you were indeed concerned for me, but you didn't have an opportunity. 
and, 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 you know, Paul's really uncomfortable the way he's saying all of this. You know, he, he's, he's almost stepping over himself, not just in the English, but in the Greek. And, and it's, 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 it's because he's trying to express some thoughts and he's worried about being misunderstood. So, he, you know, they, they remember the context here. Paul's in a Roman prison. Um, uh, and, and Paul, uh, in a Roman prison, you, you, you relied upon the outside world for your food and your sustenance. You, you, they don't feed you in a Roman prison imprisonment. Uh, the prison itself is either a hole in the ground or if you can pay for your own prison you could live in a slum. Um, but um, uh, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. They sent Paul some money through Epaphroditus. You were indeed concerned for me but you didn't have an opportunity. And then he's thinking well but now, I'm not speaking of being in need because I've learned to be content in whatever situation I'm in. I, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound uh, in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. That secret being I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So with that as the backdrop, now we get to that verse 14 where he says, Yet, yet... It was kind of you to share my trouble. Now, I, I love this. You got to remember, I started greeting Greek in Lubbock, Texas. Okay? So I, I, my Greek comes with a strong West Texas aftertaste. Okay? And, and I appreciate our Bible translators. Greatly appreciate them. But they're translating the Bible for the English-speaking world. I'm using the ESV. They actually have a, a British ESV and an American ESV. They make some nuanced changes. But here's a chance to translate the Bible into Texan and actually be dead on accurate when you do it. And they just didn't translate it into Texan. They translated it into American English. Look at these, these two Greek words, kalos and epoiosate. So, um, kalos is, is, is this idea of good, or beautiful, or pleasant, or noble, or splendid. And it's, it's, that's, that's this first word, kalos. Okay? But then when you get to poeo, poeo means to make something, or to do something, to manufacture something. So do you know what this literally says in the Greek? Instead of it was kind of you, kind is okay, you can, you can use kind for kalos, but it's, kalos is more of an intrinsic goodness, an intrinsic beautifulness. And, and the literal translation that we could do in Texas is not it was kind of you, it was yet you done good. <laughs> you done good. That's, that's literally what this is. Good, you did. You did good. You done good in Texan. You done good to share my trouble. Now this phrase, you done good, you'll find it a lot in the Bible. You'll find it in Acts 10.33, 2 Peter 1.9, Mark 7.37. The Mark passage is especially cool because they're commenting on Jesus and they comment on Jesus and they say everything he did, he, he, he did good. He done good. Jesus done good all the time. So this idea of done good is, is a neat concept. And, and I like the, the Texan version of it because there's a sense of satisfaction. Instead of just, it was kind of you to say, you done good. You did a good thing. And Paul is, he's patting them on the back. He's saying, he's, he's complimenting them. He's saying that, that I mean, wouldn't that be pretty cool to have the Apostle Paul tell you you've done good? I, I, I like it. So anyway, you've done good, but look at this. You've done good to share. Now, this word for share, um, I've talked to you about koinonia before, and koinonia is, is the noun form, but this is a verb form, koinoneo, is, is this idea, this is my aspen grove, okay? 
And those of you who've been in here before know that when I talk about the word koinonia, I give you the picture image of an aspen grove. Because aspens are trees that are all connected in the grove by the same root system. And you poison an aspen tree here, and if it's in the same grove, the same root system as the aspen tree here, this one will also die. They're all connected. You feed this one over here, and it's going to feed that one over there. If you watch, you can go to the Rockies, and, and when the leaves are changing, you can look at a mountainside, and you can tell which aspens are in groves together by the way their leaves turn. Because when the leaves of this one turn, if this is in the same grove, it will turn at the same time. And so you'll see different color patches based upon the different root systems that are connected. Well, koinonia and, and its idea is a connectedness. And what Paul is saying, he's taken the verb formed and added soon to the front of it, uh, which just means with, and he's taken that verb form and said, you're connected with, you're sharing, you're participating with me. You and I are sharing together. We've got a connectedness that's happened. But here's the bizarre part. Look at the passage. He says, we're sharing in suffering and trouble. And that's what he says. He says, we're, you, it was, you done good sharing in my trouble. Now, I, one of my favorite Greek words is this word for trouble. It's thalipsis. And thalipsis is this idea of, of, a, of a trouble that inflicts distress. Let me give you, I, I've done this before, but it never hurts to be reminded. This is the idea behind the Greek word thalipsis. If you take a rope and you put a rope there, so this is a rope. I'd say that because you may not have realized it. And then you take another rope and you put it here. So this is rope number two, okay? And then you start pulling this rope this way, and you start pulling this rope this way. And what happens in the middle? Uh-huh, this is the Greek for thalipsis. Yeah. That's the middle. That's getting squeezed. That's getting in a sense, pulled from both directions or, or more than being pulled. It's you're in the middle part. You're the part that's getting compressed and squeezed. And that's the idea behind this Greek word. And Paul uses it. And even though his audience isn't by and large Jewish, they certainly have gotten the Jewish scriptures by this point because that's the early church's Bible. And they will have gotten it in Greek. And so they'll know that that word thalipsis is used in the Old Testament quite a bit. And um, uh, it's used to translate a number of different Old Testament words. One of the words is tsar, the tsare resh resh, tsar. And, and, and it's this idea of, that's an idea of, of being bound, um, Zara is the, the form that's used, but it comes from Z Zarar, which means to be bound, to, to be tied back, to be constrained. It's, it's part of the rope image. But, but the, the other, uh, one of the other Hebrew words that's translated as philipsis is lachatz. And lachatz is like an olive being pressed and compressed. So the Hebrews got two different words for being compressed that are being bound by a rope that are both translated by this Greek word. So it, it, it works well in the Hebrew sense too. So you can look at the Old Testament and you can see Thalipsis being used in the Greek Old Testament for the distresses that happen in life where you've got loud neighbors and you're stuck with them and you can't do anything about it. That's Thalipsis in an Old Testament sense. The affliction in life where you've got problems with your neighbors that are not doing you right by your Yourself. That's, that's true affliction, a distress in life, but it's also used for the affliction of Israel. When Israel was in bondage to, to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, that was thalipsis, that was distress, that was, that was this, this uh, crunching 
righteousness. It's used at times, especially in the Psalms, for affliction of the righteous. The righteous especially that represent Israel. But this whole idea of distress and affliction, uh, if you're taking notes and you want to look at it, you can find it. I've put a number of different passages up here. I put the King's passage in here for Nathan because he's a King's guru. But, but this, this is distress. Um, uh, you'll have to excuse some of this. Deuteronomy 4.29 and 30. It's 4.29 in the English, but you find it in verse 30 in the... Or it's the other way around in the Greek because it, it, the verses don't line up in the Greek and, and English Old Testament all the time. Same is true with Psalm 9. But anyway, you can look those up and you'll get an idea of what this is. And so when Paul says, you've shared in my thalipsis, from an Old Testament perspective, he's talking about the distresses in my life. He's talking about the affliction that I've got because I'm following the Lord. And that they shared in that meant the world to him. From a New Testament perspective, you've got much the same thing, but it's just more of a pure Greek concept of distress that happens from outside circumstances. You know, that, that being in the middle of the ropes that are being pulled. Uh, you can find it in Acts, Romans, 2 Corinthians 1.4 is a great one. Look at 2 Corinthians 1.4 for just a moment. Um, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, 4. Uh, Blessed be, starting verse 3, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. He comforts us in our thalipsis so that we may be able to comfort those who are with their own thalipsis. God comforts you Heaven forbid you fail to comfort those in need as well. And so this whole idea is one that, that's sensitive to Paul. It's not just distress from outside circumstances. It's used in the New Testament for any mental or spiritual affliction. And so uh, you've got uh, just in the next chapter of 2 Corinthians 2 verse 4. Uh, Paul writes and says, you know, I wrote to you. Out of much affliction and anguish of heart and many tears. Not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love I have for you. This idea of, of affliction, of, of tribulation. I mean, this is serious stuff. This isn't, gee, I'm in a bad mood. Or, gee, the, it's taking forever to get my Chick-fil-A order. This is, this is something that's, that's, that's deeply bothersome. Now, Paul is emphatic in appreciation for the church at Philippi sharing in his affliction. And I want to call us to a deeper fellowship. I want us to figure out how we can share in each other's afflictions better. We're a, we're a, a, we're a small group in church, um, but our small group is big. And Pastor Brent does a magnificent job at trying to keep us all together with his emails. Yeah, clap, clap, clap. That's not an easy thing to do. He'll send emails that tell us what's going on in class. And those are opportunities for us to engage in fellowship. But he'll also send out emails that have prayer needs. And this is one I received recently. Uh, uh, I trust you got it too. I, have, I, I was real torn. I thought, do I leave the names up here of what we're praying about? And I thought, ah, ah. So I decided not to. But when you get those, often he'll even include an email address. Um, I would urge you, I'm not good at always emailing. But I try really hard, and I hope you try really hard, to pray for those people who are in affliction and distress. And if in the process of praying for them, you can figure out something else you can do, we need to do those things. If it's door dash them a dinner, if it's write them a note, send them an email, check on them later, whatever we can do, let's commit together to finding a deeper fellowship with each other where we're able to share in each other's afflictions. 
I, I, we will be not just a better body of Christ, but we will be a stronger body of Christ. We will have ties that, 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 that go deep. We will be a better connected Aspen Grove as we share together in those sufferings as well as in the good times. So, point one, done and dusted. Point two, I want to talk to you about an uncomfortable truth that Paul sets out here. So we'll continue with verse 15. Paul says, And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Now, Paul begins this with, um, uh, in, in the Greek, he says, uh, and you know, even you, that you is emphatic here. He's, 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 he could have just said, uh, oidate, philippesioi, uh, uh, he could have just left out an entire clause and just said, you know that, da 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 da, or you Philippians know, da 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 da, he doesn't, he's emphatic. He says you, and yeah, you, uh, the you there is plural, so it's y'all, y'all. See, there's another chance to translate this into Texan that they miss. And y'all, yourselves know, y'all know this. Y'all know that in the beginning of the gospel, and, and when he says y'all, <laughs> he says Philippians, Philippesioi. Now, you may not realize this unless your Greek is like um, probably second or third year Greek. This is not first year Greek stuff. Nathan, I'm not going to quiz you on this, but I was thinking about it. You know, this is evocative. It's an address, Philippesioi. But when Paul does this, this is Paul writing. Do you know what Paul has just done in my book? Paul has just become Joe Cool. I, I, he had to clip his beard so you could read Joe. If I had left his beard long, he just would have been cool. But he's Joe Cool. You know why? This is, just, this is just the kind of stuff that just makes me love Paul. I just think he's a stud. Okay, look what he does here. Philippesioi, that's not really Greek. Paul's writing in Greek, but that's not the Greek vocative. That's not the Greek address of the Philippians. If he was going to do that in Greek, it would be either um, Phil um, Philippes, just Philippes, or Philippinoi. Those are your Greek vocatives. He could do either one. But he didn't. Do you know what he's done? He's used the Latin form and just put it into Greek letters. This is a Latin vocative, not the Greek. And it's really cool because, remember, Philippi is a Roman colony. They're an extension of Rome. And that's something they were rightly proud of. There were not a lot of Roman colonies in the world. And that gave them certain rights. They were ruled by Roman law. The Roman Empire didn't rule everybody by Roman law. They let everybody have their own law. You know, that's why Paul's tried under the Jewish system. Until he gets transferred into the Roman system because he's a Roman citizen. So, so this is a, some, a point of pride. I won't say national pride. I'll say civic pride. That the Philippians aren't just another group of people. And Paul doesn't make a big deal out of it, but he uses the local vernacular. And he speaks to them using their Latinized name instead of their Greek name. And I got to tell you, Paul's just a stud. I mean, you got to remember, this is a guy who reads Hebrew like a first language, who reads Aramaic like a first language who reads Greek like a first language, and clearly is quite conversant in Latin as well. I don't know how his Spanish was, but I suspect it was pretty good. So um, 
here you've got Paul, and Paul is saying, you and you, even you, Philippians, emphatic you, and then he calls them an endearing name. Even you, you yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, now this is a fascinating statement, in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me. There are some scholars who've pulled their hair out over this because they're saying in the beginning of the gospel. Well, Paul, didn't he begin the gospel and teach in Cilicia and teach in these other places? Didn't he teach in, in Saudi Arabia or wherever it was? Or didn't he? You know, he certainly taught over in the Galatian region. And how could they have shared in the beginning of the gospel with Paul? Because Paul didn't even bring them to the gospel till much later in his ministry. How could this be? And these scholars who pull their hair out over this just need to come to our class on Sunday morning. Or no, they need to read some of the better commentators on this stuff or some of the better writers or just expand their broad vision. Paul's not talking about the beginning of the gospel in his ministry. He's talking about the beginning of the gospel when he left Macedonia. If you consider the... Okay, this is where I'm going to really get in trouble. Um, I have no business drawing a map. But to, to, to the, the world as it was then, if, if Italy's a boot, and Greece is whatever Greece was, and Turkey is Thanksgiving, and... Uh, I don't think I've really added done justice to Turkey. Maybe you've got the Straits of Bosphorus over here. But if you consider that, and Greece kind of does a Greece light down below. If you consider this, Macedonia was this area up here. Oh, y'all should yell at me when I'm doing a bad job. Macedonia. Okay, let's get this adjusted. All right, you got it? This is Italy. This is Israel. This is Turkey. It kind of sticks out like that. Turkey. This is Greece. All right. Macedonia is up here. Philippi would be right about here. And so when Paul left Philippi, he went to Greece. And Paul's saying that once he left Philippi, as he went to Greece, the church in Philippi helped him. They helped him financially. And we can read about it in other scriptures. But, but I don't want to pass this up without first saying that if we look at the book of Philippians as a whole, what Paul has just done is provided two bookends. Because this passage mirrors in language and ideas... Philippians 1, 3 through 5, where he started out the book. Now remember, I believe that this book is a thank you note. I think that there's a, a, a missed opportunity to translate an earlier verse that, that really substantiates what I say, and this is one of the reasons why. So here's, we've got the end, the one book end. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Go back to the beginning. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, uh, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day, from the beginning, until now. You see the book ends. And you'll recall that... If you go back and listen to that class, I lay out reasons why this, in good Greek, if you're just truly taking the Greek at its own, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you should be translated, I thank my God in your remembrance of me. And the, the placement of, of the, the all in that is, is, should drive the translation that way. This was a thank you note for Paul. Paul starts the letter out saying, I thank my God that you remembered me. And in every one of my prayers, I'm offering prayer with joy because of your partnership from the first day until now. Because they've just given him another gift. But they started out giving to him. 
And this is what he's closing the letter with as well. He says, you know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you. Now, you can find this not only here, but you can read about it in other passages. In 2 Corinthians, Paul's having a real battle with that church. Um, they, they don't... They, 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 they don't... They've got a lot of problems. Yanni talked about them last night in his lecture. Uh, a, a lot of social problems, a lot of identity problems, a lot of sectarianism that was going on, a lot of um, ethical problems. Uh, things that, that would cause most of us to read about them and say, well, those aren't even Christians. And yet Paul addresses them fully as Christians. But there were some false apostles who had come in and who had pointed out, well, you can't believe Paul. You know, Paul, first of all, he sounds hokey when he talks. He doesn't speak with power. Second of all, uh, he's, he's, you know, just, just not the, the rhetorical presence and, and third of all, you know, he had to work. If he was so hot shot, he wouldn't have to work. And, and so anyway, within the context of all of that, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. Um, oops, let me switch over. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verses 7, really starting with verse 7 here. Did I commit a sin? in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? <laughs> I didn't sell tickets. Do you think that means that I'm not any good? Would you feel better about my message if I charged you for it? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. He's talking about the Philippians having sent him the gifts. He says, when I was with you and was in need, I didn't burden anyone because the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. See, the Philippians helped Paul and that enabled Paul to preach for free and not to seek a gift from those that he was preaching to. If you read about it in Acts 18, it's fascinating there as well. Acts 18, 1 through 11. This is Paul in Corinth. All right, so Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with, with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. By the way, we have that from secular sources as well. In fact, the secular sources say that, that the Jews were causing trouble in Rome, fomenting because they were fighting over Christus. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and they worked tent makers by trade. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Then Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia. They brought the gift. Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. When they opposed him and reviled him, he shook out his garments, said, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. And he leaves there and goes to the house of a man named Titius Eustace, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And it keeps on going and going and going. But Paul ultimately is able to stay there for a year and six months teaching the word of God. And he doesn't have to work because of the gift. He's able to devote himself to full-time ministry. And so when Paul writes this and he says, you entered into partnership with me. By the way, same verb of sharing, koinoneo, same verb of sharing, this is, this is this. So they not only shared in his sufferings, but they also had shared in his preaching and in his ministry. And this is a huge deal. And he says, you entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving. Now the Greek on this is fascinating. I logon is in, you think of logon, logos as the word, 
um, and, and that's part of what's in that, but, but when you use this ACE logo, it's got a very particular commercial meaning in Greek. It's a reference to a ledger. And so Paul's taking commercial terms and ace logo is to the account of. That's whose account it is in ledger terminology, in commercial terminology. And so Paul says to the account of, and then he has dosios, which is on the giving side of the ledger, and lemsios is on the, the, the receiving side of the ledger. So you got a ledger. You got giving and you got receiving. You got uh, in incoming and outgoing. You, you got, you know, all of this kind of stuff. These are commercial terms. And Paul's using commercial terms when he writes this and says, you entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving. You were on both sides of the ledger with me. You gave, I received. And that was an incredible thing. Now, in the Greek world, and in the Roman world, not in, so in the Jewish world per se, but in the Greek and Roman world, one of the preeminent signs of friendship is giving and receiving. And so, th th that one would give, and one would receive, and then the receiver is supposed to give back, and, and sometimes even in the Greco-Roman world, it was a one-upsmanship. You know, you gave me, you know, a gift worth a dollar, I'm going to give you one worth a dollar fifty. You know, and it, and it almost even had in sometimes a competitive air. Paul has none of the competition here. But he's using the term, and, and it was used in the Greek world, but also used by Paul here as a metaphor for friendship and relationship. So he's not commercially keeping a ledger, but he's using ledger terms to try and convey an idea of friendship that existed between them. And that was a, a common thing to do and had been for hundreds of years in Greek uh, writing. So you entered into a sharing with me, a common root system. You're part of the grove. You're feeding the trees over here is causing the trees to grow over there. In giving and receiving. And, and you're the only people who were really doing that with me at that point. This was you. He says, even in Thessalonica, or Thessalonike, you sent me help for my needs. Once and again. Uh, that's uh, hapax is the Greek for once. And dis uh, means again or, or twice, but it, you put it together and it's just a, an idiom. More than once is what it means in essence. You sent me help for my needs more than once. And he says, now it's not that I seek the gift. Not that I, look, I don't seek the gift. I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Uk hote, not that I. That is, um, that's um, an idiom for, look, I, I didn't mean to say, that, that needs a two there, um, the two scoots over. I didn't mean to say, this is Paul saying, he's still in this awkward wording. And he's stumbling over himself like he was in verses 10 through 13. He says, look, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again, more than once. But, but I don't mean to say that I'm looking for your present. It's not that I, I, I'm, I'm seeking desperately for your gift. He says, what I really am seeking is the fruit, the carpone, the fruit that increases to your credit. And again, he's using a slogan here, and the, the translators pick up the commercial aspect of that in your ledger, in your account. And so the translators use credit because that's a commercial term. So I seek the fruit that's going to increase in your ledger. So these common words that he's using here, that they gave to his account and he received to his account, 
But then he puts this little twist in it. Do you see the twist? He says, you gave to my account and I received it. And I'm delighted that you invested in me, to use the commercial analogy. But I care about it because it shows me you love me. But even more so because God's going to invest in your account. You give to me and it means the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's made my life better and I really appreciate it. But what I really, really, really know is that God's going to invest in you. This is going to go into your account from God. I mean, here it is. He, Paul says, I've received full payment and more. Anything you ever owed me, you have more than done. And I'm well supplied. I've gotten from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. It's a fragrant offering. It's a sacrifice that's acceptable. And it's pleasing to God. I and mean, that's a huge deal. This is a fragrant offering. This is a sacrifice that's acceptable. This is something that's pleasing to God. But it's got that twist. It's still got that twist. You invested in me, but God's going to invest in you. And Paul brings this home in the next couple of verses. He says, and my God will supply. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Our, my God will supply. This word supply, plereo, means to, to, to make full, to fill up, to complete. To, 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 it's it's um, uh, the standard joke I used to have with, with Becky. It's hot up here. The standard joke I used to have with Becky when, when we were early married is she would, um, she's a coffee drinker. I don't drink coffee. I love the smell. I just hate the flavor, right? So I don't drink coffee. But every morning she drinks coffee and she puts cream in it. And I'd watch her and she's doing this and she pours coffee and then she pours cream and every time the cream basically overflows the cup. And one morning I said to her, can I make your coffee for you? And she said, no, that's okay. And I said, no, let me make it for you. I've been watching you. I know how to do it. And she said, well, no, you don't know how much cream I like. And I said, yeah, you just put the cream in until it overflows. I've seen this. <laughs> Plareo. It just is full to the brim. Overflowing. And so when he says that my God will supply, he's using a word that, that is almost uber supply. He'll totally supply. He'll make it full. Every need of yours. Now, it doesn't say every want. It says every need. Every need of yours according to his riches. And plautos is the word for riches here. It's the same root concept of being full. Plautos is, is this, is riches, it's fullness, it's completeness. So he's going to supply, he's going to make you overflow with all of that overflowing he's got. All of his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And then he ends with, to our God and Father. Be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, why do I call this an uncomfortable truth? Um, I grew up, and, and, and we are creatures of, of our upbringing. And there was an extended member of our family who um, was an interesting paradox. In some ways, he was um, kind-hearted. And in some ways, he was mean. In some ways, he was protective. And in some ways, he was destructive. And he had grown up a Christian. 
and he had decided he'd gotten the bad end of a business deal from a fella at church. Now, this is my understanding as a seventh grade kid, eighth grade kid. So I could have this totally wrong. But from my perception, he'd gotten a raw deal and a business deal from someone at church. And so he decided the church was a bunch of people after money and he wasn't going to go back. And he quit going to church. The definition, I might add, of cutting off your nose to spite your face. And occasionally when they, he and, 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 and those with him would come visit us, mom and dad would get them to go to church with us. And so on Sunday morning, they'd go to church with us. And I remember it seemed without fail, any time we were able to get this fella to go to church with us, the church sermon that Sunday would be about giving. <laughs> and I can remember mom and dad just looking at each other exasperated and saying, how, you know, what do we do? Not invite him to church, you know, but you invite him and he comes back and oh, that's what I've always said, all they're interested in is the money. I think that's probably some of why it's uncomfortable for me to talk about these verses. But I got to tell you something. I don't work at this church. There's not a dime you give to this church that flows in any way, shape, form, and fashion into my bank account. I'm on the giving end of this with, with you guys. So if anybody ought to be able to talk about this, it ought to be someone like me. But it's still so tough to talk about because everybody's in a different position. And a lot of people don't have the resources. That, you know, Jesus preached the perfect sermon on this. When the rich people are all going in and clattering in the trumpet containers their money and the widow gives a widow's mite, which is so cheap you can still find them in the dust on the streets of Jerusalem 2,000 years later. You can buy them at a curio shop for a penny a piece. I mean, they're, they're just worth nothing. And Jesus pointed out and said, that, that widow who just gave that gave more than everybody else. And I'm not into the prosperity gospel. I'm not telling you, hey, give to this and you're going to get that. I'm not telling you, you'll know you're successful in God because he will give you a jet. And I get mad at the televangelists who act like that. And I get mad at the people who ask for money for the kingdom when it's going into their pockets. But I'll tell you that this church is one where I've gotten to see it from the inside and the out. And this church is so good and careful with money. And this church is really trying to serve and to seek and to do right. And not just this church, but there are some outstanding ministry opportunities. Ministries that are 501c3s where you get a tax deduction. But there are ministry opportunities where people are hurting and they need help. And there's no tax deduction and no one's ever going to know it except the Lord. And there is an uncomfortable to talk about truth. That when you sow and you give on that side of the ledger that if you're doing it from the right motives not to be seen not to be high and mighty not to be oh looky looky but when you're doing it in service to God because the heart of God has tweaked your heart to the need God responds and he responds richly and he will supply all your needs according to the glory of God and, 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 and the glory of his riches. And that may mean your physical needs, but it may be your spiritual needs. There are some people who need their hearts to be softened and broken. They need that more than they need money in their bank account. And the more we identify, look, Christ gave. He never came to earth to get. He came to earth to give. I mean, oh, I'm going to the cross. Have a good time. No. He's not going for what he got out of it. He's going for what he could give to us. 
And so when we identify and we become more godly, God's going to work in our lives. And he's going to take care of whatever needs we have, and that's an uncomfortable truth, but I wanted to say it because it's in the text. All right, let's finish this. The larger world. Because of Paul walking his walk of faith, he has made it to Rome. I know some minor scholars, and I'm sorry, where's the camera on me? N.T. Wright, sorry, Tom. I know you think he wrote this from Ephesus. I think you're wrong. Um, uh, but this is, is one of the passages. Uh, Paul ends it with this. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. And all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. God's church has crept even into the household of Nero. Now that might mean his slaves, that might mean his attendants, that doesn't necessarily mean that his, you know, Aunt Lucy is now a believer. We don't know who. But God's work in the larger world is amazing. The reason I'm so glad we had our friends from South Africa here this morning, we've got Ben Holman here, and Ben, I don't have time to pull you up on stage. Ben is, is um, the executive director of a group called Langham Ministries, Langham Partnership. Go online and read langhampartnership.org. Langham is the street, Langham Place, where John Stott's ministry was, where his church was that he pastored for years and years and years. He took all of his income, all of his royalties from every book he ever wrote and every lecture he ever gave, and he put them into a nonprofit that was set up and has been going on in the decades since he's died and is in right now supplying education funds to people, especially in developing countries, who will learn and get scholastic and get published, write commentaries that are in Africa that appeal to the Africans that are reading them. And, 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 and in the Far East, same stories. And, and they've got 75, 85 scholars right now that they're funding. And, and there are hundreds and hundreds. And Vianney was one of them, PhD in Africa, now staying in Africa, rearing up others to learn and to spread throughout their continent, sharing the gospel. God's at work all over this world. And we don't need to be, I mean, we've got Lori and Dietrich here. They've got a, a, like a second son to them, Yach, who is studying now at George Whitfield College to do the same thing. We don't need to have blinders on and think that CFBC or Houston or Texas or the United States of America is where God lives. We need to see that he's at work in the world. And so Paul then ends with this, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that's the end of his letter. Here are your points to ponder. I want to forge a deeper fellowship. I want us to share in troubles. Point number two, carefully consider the ledger. I want to seek the fruit that increases to your credit. And point number three, God is doing great things right now. He's moving all over the world. And that's what we get from Philippians. That is the key, the secret, the book, the whole thing. It's time for church, but let me first bless you in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, may, may Jesus enrich our spirits and supply our needs, deepen our fellowship, make us more Christ-like, all to the glory of your kingdom throughout this world and throughout the ages. We bless you, we honor you, we praise you. Amen.